Well, welcome everybody to today's webinar, uh, Stories from the Field, Mold at RPI. We're very excited to welcome some special guests from Rensselaer Polytech Institute Library, who I'll be introducing in a moment. But before we dive in, I just want to welcome all of you again to another DIPSNY program, the Documentary Heritage and Preservation Services for New York program. We are a program of the New York State Library and the New York State Archives to provide educational supports and services to collecting institutions across New York State with services provided by the Conservation Center for Art and Historic Artifacts. My name is Anastasia Matikio, and I am the program manager for DIPSY. I'm just here briefly to set the stage before passing it off to our guest speakers. I do want to just let everybody know as we dive in that this webinar is being recorded and that we will be sharing the recording as well as the slides with everyone within a week of the webinar. Um, if you require, have any questions or require any information before that, please feel free to reach out to Gypsy staff as well as our speakers. Next slide. All right, so today we have stories from the field mold at RPI. Uh, this is a little different from webinars that we've done in the past in that we've invited our speakers to speak about a mold outbreak at their institution and to share insight and lessons learned after they tackled this issue in their collections. I'm happy to welcome today Jennifer Monger and Tammy Gobert from Rensselaer Polytech Institute Libraries. Tammy is the Preservation and Access Archivist at Rensselaer Polytech Institute, where she has worked for the past 28 years. She previously served as a regional archivist for the Documentary Heritage Program after starting her career at Cornell University's Archives and Special Collections Department. In addition to her archival duties, Tammy chairs the Rensselaer Library's Disaster and Emergency Preparedness Team. Jennifer Munger is Assistant Institute Archivist at Rensselaer Polytech Institute, where she has worked for five years ensuring the sustainability and accessibility of collections in all formats. A central focus of Jennifer's archival duties is to chair the Libraries and Archives Digital Repositories Committee. Prior to RPI, Jennifer was the Assistant Director at the Essex County Historical Society, developing and implementing projects which cultivated collaborations and community engagement. I encourage all of you to take a moment, if you haven't already, to introduce yourself and where you're joining us from in the chat, if you are so comfortable. And with that, I'm going to pass it off to our speakers to tell us all about mold at RPI. Thank you, Anastasia. Hello, everyone. So uh, just before we get started, a little housekeeping. You will be muted and your video will be turned off for this webinar. Therefore, we won't be able to see you, nor will you see us, but you will certainly see our slides. Please enter your questions into the chat and we will answer as many as we can at the end of our presentation. And if you're having any technical difficulties, please feel free to ask Dipsney for some assistance in the chat. Um, and so it's official, we will get started. So in 2016, Tammy and I made great strides drafting a disaster preparedness plan. However, we discovered that we still weren't in a position to handle a mold outbreak that affected Folsom Library from 2018 to 2019. I tackled the initial aftermath of a cracked water pipe while Tammy dealt with a mold remediation contractor when the issue became too large to handle. This is the story we'll share with you today. First, we'll provide some background on the site where Folsom Library is located, regale you of some issues we've contended with in the past, share some fairly gross and disgusting photographs from our mold outbreak in 2018, talk about our latest adventures in 2020 and then we'll open it up for some questions at the end but before we launch in we'd like to start with a poll question for today's attendees so tammy i think that's you okay so let's see i think we want to we can answer this one. Do you intend to develop a disaster preparedness plan at your institution? Ooh, let's see. I 
think people are still answering. That looks like about it. So 16 of our 81 participants, 16% say yes, 10% maybe, oh good, 25% we have one in progress. Excellent. Okay. All right. Jen? Yes. So this is the main campus of Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute located on a hill above the city of Troy in New York. You can see on the right an arrow pointing to Folsom Library. I'm also pointing out Voorhees Computing Center, which used to be a chapel to set the stage. For the next few slides, I'm going to focus on this site, which is a crucial part in understanding some of the issues we've dealt with in the past. Now, in terms of potential disasters that can cause harm to any of Rensselaer's buildings and collections, our biggest concerns are water and fire or a combination of both. First, let's go back to 1950. The building you see in the foreground with the tall spires was built in 1858 and was known as the Troy University. After the university failed, the property changed hands several times and was occupied first by a seminary and later the Sisters of St. Joseph. Over time, the sisters built a separate chapel and later added a connector building uh, be between, connector between the two buildings. In 1958, RPI purchased the property from the sisters and renamed the spired portion the University Building. By 1969, RPI decided to demolish just the University Building in the foreground to make way for Folsom Library, but they kept the connector and the chapel. Folsom Library construction was completed on the site in 1976. The chapel remained and became the Voorhees Computing Center, it still is, and the connector building, which you see sandwiched between the two large buildings, once joined together the seminary and the chapel, but was later dismantled and removed. Where the connector building was removed, an open plaza now remains. So here is uh, Folsom Library on the left and the entrance to the Voorhees Computing Center on the right. Multiple grates lead to drainage pipes below the plaza's cement floor. And now I'll show you um, what's underneath the plaza. Below the plaza between the two buildings lies collection storage divided between the two buildings, which means those drainage pipes run through the ceiling space above the storage areas. The storage space on the left contains RPI student theses and dissertations. This room holds approximately 2100 linear feet of bound volumes and is monitored by public services staff. On the right is a secure area we call the cage, which houses institute archives and special collections materials. The cage holds over 4,200 linear feet of paper records, audiovisual materials, art, and artifacts. Altogether, these collections constitute the bulk of our unique and irreplaceable resource, research resources. And it's one thing to show you floor plans. So here are some photographs of the actual spaces to give you all a better sense of the storage rooms. So again, the image on the left is thesis storage and on the right is what we call the cage um, where we house archival collections. And now I'll turn this over to Tammy who will talk about some early issues we've experienced under the plaza. The Cajun Plaza have suffered from water infiltration and flooding for years. In the cage, water percol up, percolates up through old drains that were inadequately sealed when the connector building was demolished. It streams down the east wall, which you can see on the right, and it seeps in along the bottom of the north wall. The thesis room has also had problems. The ceiling leaks in the northeast corner during heavy rainfall. And just to complicate things, the library's HVAC system has caused leaks on the fourth floor. Next slide. Over the years, several attempts have been made to address water problems, including old floor drains have been capped with pressure valves, 
Cracks in the plaza pavement are periodically sealed. Bollards were installed on entrances to the plaza to prevent vehicles from driving on it. Plastic sheeting has been draped over shelving and vulnerable collections have been moved out of harm's way. We've also worked with RPI's environmental services staff to repair known leaks. Next slide. Despite these efforts, we've had to deal with a number of ongoing problems, including in 2014, there was a series of leaks over our artifact collection in the cage, as shown in the image on the right. When a maintenance worker inspected the situation, a rusted pipe literally fell apart in his hands. A portion of that pipe was replaced with PVC, and that's what you're seeing on the left. In 2016, a large amount of water forced its way in from multiple directions and flooded the cage. Fortunately, no collections were affected. I think it's fair to say our collections have long been at high risk for water damage. Next slide. Given this situation, you might think the library would have had a disaster preparedness plan long ago, but prior to 2019, we did not. Around 2003, I served on a committee that created a safety and security manual, which focused almost exclusively on dealing with building issues and human safety. The only information pertaining to collections consisted of a few resources on handling wet materials. Once the manual was completed, it was posted on the library's intranet, never to be reviewed or updated again. I periodically advocated for adding new sections to the manual, but it never became a top priority. So the manual remained limited in scope, and there was never any staff training. After several years, it was largely forgotten. Jen? Fast forward to 2016, Rensselaer Library's new director, Andrew White asked if we would be interested in an upcoming program through the New York Archives about disaster preparedness planning, sponsored by the local Alliance for Response. AFR brings cultural heritage and emergency professionals together at the local level. Tammy and I eagerly volunteered and started off as a two-person team. The director notified staff of our project and asked them to support us as needed. The program was structured as a series of workshops and webinars. We were provided with a series of customizable templates for compiling relevant information for a disaster plan. And we were matched with a local mentor from another academic institution. An important aspect of the AFR training includes watching a series of webinars. They focused on using volunteers in emergency situations implementing the incident command system, sources of funding, and crisis communications. Many of these webinars can be found online, and I'll include some suggested links at the end of the presentation for you. As I mentioned, a key component to the AFR program was to work through a series of templates designed to help an institution get better organized with documentation in the event there is an emergency. There were too many templates to share on the slide, so I'm only showing what our template checklist consisted of, separated into three categories. Disaster planning goals, disaster plan content, and institutional attachments. Because we were only a team of two, we divided up the tasks. I took on updating the library's floor plans and emergency features, editing the old safety and security manual, and reviewing and deleting redundant recovery documentation, which we found on the library's intranet. Tammy set out to begin the infamous pocket response plan, a template for compiling contact information for a variety of people who need to be reached in an emergency situation. Tammy? I also tackled an AFR template that lists emergency supplies that are important to have on hand. I revised the list and ordered supplies for each floor of the main library, as well as our architecture library, which is located in another building. Some of my colleagues helped sort everything into bins, and we identified suitable storage spaces on each floor. Next slide. Our staff also took advantage of training opportunities. In June 2017, Dipsney held a series of workshops across New York State called Disaster Response and Recovery 
a hands-on intensive. Jen and I and four of our colleagues attended the sessions. The program began with an overview of the incident command system and basic salvage techniques. This was followed by hands-on recovery drills using the information that was shared in the morning. Between our AFS training and the workshop, we felt very prepared. Next slide. In fact, the day after the hands-on workshop, Jen and I proudly presented our progress at the New York Archives Conference. When we walked away from that presentation, we had a plan of action to continue moving forward. Finalize documents based on the AFR templates, establish a permanent disaster preparedness committee, make the plan available accessible to the rest of the staff, organize and participate in additional staff training, and set up a review process to regularly update the plan. One of the last things we said in the NIAC presentation was, hopefully we won't encounter any major disasters, but if we do, we'll definitely be more prepared than we were a year ago. Famous last words. Next slide. Before we knew it, months went by. Jen and I became swamped with various committee responsibilities along with other duties as assigned. Like many archivists, our team of two was faced with competing priorities and our forward momentum on disaster preparedness gradually slowed to a halt. Next slide. After all our optimism in 2017, Jen and I were taken aback when our supervisor announced he'd discovered yet another their source of water below the plaza. While we don't have a photo of us on that day, these images portray our general reaction of what again? It was late on a Friday afternoon when he found saturated ceiling tiles on the floor in the thesis room. After notifying us, he contacted facilities management to assess the situation. They determined that a drain pipe above the drop ceiling had cracked and was dripping water onto the theses and dissertations below. Despite our training and offers to help, Jen and I were not involved in salvaging the wet materials, and we were assured that the situation was under control. For reasons that will soon become clear, that day is forever etched in our minds. Jen? The image on the left shows a section of shelving units housing feces located in the storage room. It's difficult to see, but there are three shelving units here. Thankfully, they are located between two doorways and set apart from the other units in the room. The bottom arrow points to where this is located in the storage room. The top arrow points to where the pipe cracked directly above. Immediately after this was discovered, 150 volumes were removed from the top shelves and rehoused in an unused section of compact shelving on the first floor of the library. Also, facilities management replaced the faulty section of pipe. Two weeks had passed since the cracked pipe was found and I was asked to review the, the volumes moved from the affected area in thesis storage and provide feedback. Tammy, my disaster preparedness study and team partner, was out of state dealing with a family emergency. Unfortunately, many of the wet volumes failed to dry out thoroughly. Pages were still damp. Many of the covers were coated with a white powdery mold, as you see on the left. I found abnormal spotting on the inside covers and there was heavy discoloration along the inner margins. This indicated that mold was probably growing inside the spine, so I took a utility knife and scored one of the covers, which is what you're seeing in the image on the right. Sure enough, mold had made its way down the spines of many of the volumes, chewing on all the yummy, uh, the yummy stuff like glue and fiber. I quickly set up a station, solicited staff volunteers, and we immediately began removing the covers and bindings in order to salvage the text. This went on for three straight days, scoring, drying, and reassessing each volume, noting which ones were in the clear and which ones needed ongoing attention. Admittedly, there was an oversight on my end. I was three days in, and just when I thought we had a handle on salvaging the, the volumes, a staff member commented to me, quote, and these are just the ones from the top shelves. 
I had just started to feel like the situation was under control, but at that point, I also realized that I had tunnel vision. I was focusing on the issue in front of me and disregarding an investigation of the entire area in storage. I went into the storage room and much to my dismay, it was true, only volumes from the top shelves below the cracked pipe had been removed, which is what you're seeing in the, Im in, in the image on the right. Shocked, dismayed, and scared, I pulled a few volumes out here and there, but not all the way, just enough to notice mold on the covers a few shelves below the top as you see in the image on the left. And if that wasn't alarming enough, I realized something else. This was about to become a solo endeavor. I was the only archivist available. Tammy, my colleague, was gone. The Institute archivist was on vacation and the library director was leaving for Europe. Desperate to confer on next steps, I called our mentor from the AFR training, but unfortunately she was away too. I knew some of the necessary steps to take, but in all honesty, I was starting to feel intimidated by the situation. I thought I knew enough about mold, its potential health risks, and the fact that it can wreak havoc without anyone knowing, but I wasn't quite sure if I was crossing a dangerous boundary. Even though I knew the clock was ticking and that, and that time was certainly not on my side, I spent two days giving myself a crash course on mold and cultural heritage collections. So here are some fun facts about mold. It loves our cultural heritage collections. It grows and reproduces really fast, excreting digestive enzymes that drastically alter, weaken, and stain paper, cloth, or leather. And mold loves moisture, high temperatures, and stagnant air. So with that, I think it's a great time to ask our second poll question. Tammy, if you could pull that up. I will do my best. So I think we want, oh good. Oh yes, have you ever dealt with a mold outbreak in your libraries and archives? Oh, this is fun. <laughs> <laughs> well, quite a few. So, yeah, so it's looking like 21% say yes, 18% no, and 15% sort of, which I would love to hear about the sort of. <laughs> Great. Okay, let's move on. Okay, thank you. All right, so. After my crash course, I was unsure how to proceed. I decided to call my colleagues at the New York State Archives who were involved with the AFR training and explained the situation. They allayed my fears and the next day they arrived at Folsom Library and we investigated the affected area. We checked everything and determined that water from the pipe had run down throughout the central shelving unit to the bottom shelf. When we started removing the volumes, we saw that some were sitting in pools, small pools of water, and had grown vibrant green fuzzy mold on their undersides. We brought hundreds of volumes out to compact shelving for cleaning and review. However, unlike the volumes salvaged in the previous weeks, these new moldy volumes were far more complex. These new volumes included photographs and slides inside plastic sleeves. Some included drawings, maps, and different inks. We cleaned, scored, separated pages, maps, and drawings, and removed photographs and 35 millimeter slides. This routine became the average day. Mold was feeding off the yummy glues, fixers, paper, and whatever else it could find. The coming weeks consisted of fanning, drying, separating, and reassessing each volume in unique ways. Thanks to all the help from my colleagues at the New York State Archives, I was well on my way. About eight weeks had gone by since the cracked pipe was found and salvage initially began. Physical and intellectual control of the volumes was underway. We managed to salvage the majority of the content. Sadly, countless photographs were destroyed in the process from the amount of mold growing inside the plastic sleeves. 
there were only a couple of volumes that were a total loss. The paper was stuck so tight together, there was nothing we could do. I was on the home stretch, finalizing documentation and coordinating with staff to assist with preservation photocopying where possible. And yet, I received an email from the library's public services staff. More mold was found, this time on the shelving unit to the right of the central one, where we removed all the volumes, despite the fact that we checked this entire section. Mold was lurking, fear heightened to a new level. The situation was out of control, and we could no longer manage it. We desperately needed help to proceed safely, both for the health of staff and preservation of the collection. It was time to contact the Institute's Environmental Health and Safety Department to help us safely assess the situation. Rather than calling this a word cloud, I've created what I call a stress cloud to represent how I felt at this time. So much of the work fell on me personally because of the, all the absences I was frustrated, exhausted, and I wanted to wash my hands of the whole issue, sadly. Fortunately, this co coincided with Tammy's return and she was able to share the burden. And I was relieved to begin passing the baton to her so that she could take some of the weight off my shoulders. We all work for cultural heritage institutions because we wanna safeguard history and preserve records in perpetuity for future generations. But when systems and policies related to disaster preparedness and planning are not in place, this can take an emotional, physical, and psychological toll on staff. Tammy. At this point, I was glad I could help carry some of the load that Jen had been bearing. But we needed to involve more people in dealing with the library's ongoing problems. I felt it was time to renew our plan to establish a formal committee to handle disasters. So I approached the library director and volunteered to chair the committee, which he approved in late 2018. The team consisted of Jen, me, and four other members of the library staff. As Jen mentioned, we also reached out to the Director of Environmental Health and Safety for guidance. That fall, we attended a Dipsy workshop called Mold Prevention, Detection, Recovery to better prepare for the work ahead. And in the meantime, a member of our public services staff began preparing the rest of the thesis collection to be moved to a safer location. Next slide. Unfortunately, the conditions in the thesis room were making her sick. The space itself had become contaminated, so even working with the unaffected volumes posed health risks. At that point, I was tasked with coordinating the library's mold remediation project. This was an altogether new challenge, responding to an active mold bloom at the same time I was charged with developing a disaster plan. One issue was that theses and dissertations are not part of the archives holdings. And it was frustrating to discover that the Institute doesn't consider theses and dissertations permanent records. In addition to my concerns about mold, I felt pulled between competing directions. Should we discard theses after all the work Jen had done to salvage them or spend money conserving the moldy volumes? Now I was stressed out and needed professional assistance. Next slide. Fortunately, our environmental health and safety staff agreed it was time to bring in the big guns. The EHS director recommended getting bids from mold specialists to handle the situation. She also advised us to participate in RPI's Respiratory Protection Program to ensure the proper use of N95 respirators. N95s are recommended for working around mold, and luckily we had some in our emergency supply bins. To get started, Jen researched companies with experience in mold abatement in libraries and archives. I reached out to two of them that had local offices. Both companies indicated I needed to consult with an independent industrial hygienist to assess the situation and outline a plan of work. We ended up with a plan that involved two approaches. One was to do intensive cleaning and disinfection of the three sections of shelving and moldy books below where the pipe had leaked. Additionally, the entire room was to be thoroughly disinfected. 
we decided to discard 32 volumes that were too moldy to deal with on site, but we managed to save the rest of the collection. Working with EHS had the added bonus of having the cost covered by their budget rather than library funds. After lots of planning, the cleanup was scheduled for December 2019, over a year after the initial incident. Next slide. The remediation process was really interesting to observe. A crew of over a dozen workers arrived and worked all day. Some built a containment chamber out of heavy duty plastic that encapsulated the area directly under the leak. The image on the left shows the chamber separating the moldy shelving from the next row of volumes. The zippered opening at the far end allowed workers to enter and exit as they cleaned each thesis before moving it to a clean book cart. They then cleaned every surface with a powerful antimicrobial agent as seen in the photo on the right. They also ran an air scrubber, the red object in the back of the chamber, to remove as many mold spores as possible. Next slide. Other workers wiped down every surface throughout the room from ceiling to floor, books, shelves, light fixtures, everything. After the crew left, the air scrubbers ran for another day or two. Then the hygienist returned to conduct air quality testing. Sadly, the containment chamber failed and a few workers had to return for additional cleaning. They determined that rust on the bottom shelves was probably harboring mold, so we decided to discard three of them. Fortunately, the retest was a success. Next slide. While all this was going on, the disaster and emergency preparedness team began its work. Our mandate was to complete a disaster plan by summer 2019. In order to ensure that everyone was on the same page, we started by attending webinars and reading about the process of developing a plan. Luckily, we were able to salvage parts of the old safety and security manual, and we used the documents Jen and I had created using AFR templates. We met regularly, divided the tasks, and in September 2019, we presented the new manual to the directive. Our plan is very basic, but this time around, it includes lots more information about collections, salvage priorities, and who to go to when something goes wrong. Next slide. After the holidays, we shared our plan at a staff retreat, and we distributed pocket response plans to everyone so they would have contact information readily available in case of an emergency. The prep plan is designed to fold down to the size of a credit card to make it easy to carry around. For added protection, the folded plans fit perfectly into little Tyvek envelopes you can order online. In addition, the library purchased more compact shelving so public services staff could move everything out of the mold room. Our moving plan was set to begin in March. Next slide. But of course, that's when COVID-19 struck. On March 18th, everyone except essential staff were required to work from home through the end of the month. We couldn't know it at the time, but our work from home order extended until August with extremely limited staff access to the library. We could do nothing but cross our fingers that no more disasters would occur before we returned to campus. Jen? When we were sent home March 18th of this year, we weren't allowed back in the library unless we received explicit permission from the head of our division, the CIO. There was, however, one RPI Environmental Services staff member, we'll call him Mel, who was deemed essential and he was in the building on a daily basis. Archive staff worked with Mel a lot over the years. He would assist us with basement issues like extracting water from the cage after a heavy rain. While we were working from home, Mel would occasionally check on these storage spaces for us. On Tuesday, August 4th, I had received permission to enter the building. We were starting to gear back up to be back on campus, and I had to do some office preparation work. As per my instructions, I called Mel to ensure he would be in the building and available to let me in. On this particular day, the Capital Region was experiencing a torrential downpour, and when I called, Mel was a bit panicked. He stated, quote, there's water pouring over the archives. I asked him where exactly he was seeing water. He said he was in the room with all the bound volumes. 
that was my immediate clue that it wasn't technically archives, but it was the thesis storage room. Again, I immediately called the library director, got dressed, and went to the library. Sure enough, Mel was right. Water was trickling down from another section of the same pipe we dealt with in 2018. In the image on the right, you see a few shelving units in the foreground that are empty. Those are the shelves where all the moldy volumes were removed in 2018 and 2019. To the right of Mel, who is standing in the doorway, is the newly affected area. The image on the left shows the plastic bag Mel used to try to protect the volumes below from the dripping water above. Thankfully, this new issue was dealt with right away. We can handle wet material. Mold obviously is another issue. And as per usual, water dripped all the way down to the bottom shelf. Mel assisted me with removing all the volumes in this unit, about 250, and I rolled them out to compact shelving on book carts. When Tammy arrived on the scene, we dove right into the emergency bins and grabbed heavy duty plastic, paper towels, clips, and scissors. All handy things to have in an emergency bin. We weren't entirely sure what was happening with this pipe again. Mel had called FIX, RPI's facilities management department, but he didn't hear back from anyone. So as a precaution, we had to devise a system. With our heavy duty plastic, we set up a funnel to divert water from the pipe into a garbage bag. And I'll brag a little bit and say the next day there was in fact water in the bottom of that, um, that garbage can. We also covered the shelf volumes on the units across from the newly affected area, just in case. We secured the storage room shelves to the best of our ability. Tammy and I went to work taking care of the volumes that we removed for drying. We fanned approximately 229 feces and spread them out on compact shelving. Mel set up heavy duty floor fans to circulate air in order to ensure drying and prevent mold growth in the hot and humid buildings since the air had been shut off over the summer while we were away. Thankfully, these were quite easy to manage because they were just wet and we were able to have the fans on throughout the day, knowing we'd be able to check on everything again the next day. As a preventative measure, Tammy and I moved an additional 268 volumes from thesis storage because they were near the leak. At the end of our 10 hour day, Tammy and I walked around to snap photos and capture a few videos. Mel had gone for the day, so it was just the two of us, bewildered, tired, and scratching our heads. It was frustrating to say the least, but I'm relieved to tell you that nothing else was damaged aside from the obvious effects of water inside the building. We witnessed water dripping down the east wall behind several sections of thankfully empty shelving. More water had infiltrated the archives cage area covering the floor. Water was also dripping behind archival storage products and a large amount of water cascaded onto shelving in an adjacent storage room that is part of the Voorhees Computing Center. By this point, Tammy and I were left to debate how to deal with remaining issues. Even though water was sitting on the floor of the cage, we knew it wouldn't get to the level of the boxes on the bottom shelves. After conferring with the library director, unfortunately, we had to take our chances. We packed up and exited, knowing we would be back the next morning. The following morning, when I arrived, plumbers were already there to inspect the leak over the feces. They believed it was due to a drain that couldn't handle the sheer amount of water back up from the rain, not a broken pipe. Our work continued though. Mel extracted over 30 gallons of water from the floor of the cage. Tammy and I inspected wet volumes, which were drying nicely, no evidence of mold. Thankfully, the water had stopped. This more recent issue opened our eyes to several improvements we need to, we need to make in our disaster plans. For starters, Mel didn't know about the pocket response plan. Granted, that plan was created for us never anticipating we'd be dealing with water, 
in the middle of a global health crisis. Secondly, Mel, was aware, Mel wasn't aware that we had emergency bins with particular supplies like heavy duty plastic. All he had was a garbage bag to help protect the feces in the storage room prior to my arrival. With all that said, there will always be something we can't foresee. There will always be room for improvement. And lastly, the stress of dealing with these issues will always remain, but what makes the stress easier to handle is knowing your own limitations and accepting them. Tammy. I had hoped that once the library reopened, we could begin transferring the theses to their safe new home. However, our public services staff is stretched thin with new responsibilities, such as monitoring safety protocols and paging materials for curbside pickup. They also serve as greeters, reminding students to wear masks and observe social distancing requirements. I might add that RPI's strict protocols have kept coronavirus infections to six positive cases since August 1st, an amazing feat on a college campus. The archives remains closed to researchers and we split our time between working from home and in our offices. Consequently, this thesis collection remains vulnerable under aging pipes and a leaky ceiling. We continually seek assistance from our facilities department to address water problems, but budget constraints and COVID priorities limit their ability to take preventive action on the scale that's needed. Next slide. When it comes to mold, the old adage that an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure is certainly applicable. If our wet materials hadn't been fanned and fully dried immediately, I'm sorry, if our wet materials had been fanned and fully dried immediately after the leak was discovered, we would not have had to abate a mold bloom. So here are a few takeaways from our experience. Personal safety comes first. Emergency supplies aren't enough. You need a trained team that knows how to respond to a disaster. And the staff needs to know who to go to when an emergency arises. Good communication is essential. It's important to be aware of your physical and emotional limitations. Reach out for help when you need it. Smile and support each other through the process. And be prepared for the unexpected by having a written plan. At this point, we have one final question we'd like to ask you all. Jen, could you uh, start? I think it's poll question number one. Oh, sure. Great. Does your institution have a disaster preparedness plan? Yes, no, I think so. Ooh, numbers are looking good. A lot of people have disaster preparedness plans. That's, That's great. great. Okay, so um, I think it looks like about 62% do, 32% do not, and 6% I think so. And that is actually a very good result. Okay. Thank you. you can end that poll. Yes, I did. Yep. Okay. You still seeing it? <laughs> <laughs> Next slide. Okay. For those of you who are interested in creating a disaster plan, or if you just want to update one you already have, we've compiled some useful resources in this slide. There are also resources specifically on dealing with mold issues. It isn't necessary to write them down because DIPSY staff will send a follow-up email to everyone who registered for today's program. It will include links to a PDF of our slides, a recording of our presentation, and answers to any questions we're unable to address today. Next slide. So at this point, we'd like to begin answering your questions. If you haven't done so already, please type your questions or comments in the chat box and we'll respond to as many as we can. If we don't get through them all, we can follow up through Dipsney after the webinar. One thing to remember, Jen and I know a lot more about dealing with mold than we did two years ago, but we are not mold experts. Jen, you can start reading questions now. Okay, so there was one, Tammy, that came in. What, is, what, what are current thoughts on temperature and humidity in records not currently affected by mold to protect them? Do you remember what those 
are? I do not. In any case, um, I would in I would always consult um, information from reliable sources. Uh, Dipstein. If we go back to the previous slide, Jen, uh, sure. there's there's a lot of good information through NEDCC and uh, the Conservation Center. Um, all of those would have the detailed information you would need. Um, in our case, we don't have control of the temperature and humidity in our um, sections of the building. So it's kind of a moot point, although we do whine a lot when we feel like it's getting um, out of control. Typically, our spaces tend to be a little on the dry side, but of course that's a seasonal issue because in the summer, um, the building does get more humid um but it's always cold in here so that's kind of a good thing for us tammy another question um were the lights left off after the flooding was discovered mold really loves the dark and i think i think they're referring to what happened in august and i do believe that we left the lights on um well i do not remember but i but i i also recall that we uh, we had fans running everywhere that we could. Um, don't believe the lights were left on in the area where we were drying the volumes in August of this right. right. Um, but that's because you would have to leave them on for the entire floor. Right. Uh, you know, for a couple shelves of, of books. I shouldn't say a couple shelves, a couple ranges of books. Um, so, I, but I, Jen, you may re recall better about um, what we did in the cage. <laughs> Some of it's a blur. <laughs> it's a blur, especially when you've dealt with this as many times as we have. But again, because we were able to get all of the moisture out of the room, um, out of the thesis storage room, that is, we weren't terribly afraid of mo a mold bloom at that point, and we knew we would be back the next day. Um, yeah, the yeah. room was oh, probably sorry. dry, so uh, other than the moisture on the floor. Go ahead. Uh, another question. This is interesting. In regards to the long-term needs of staffing the disaster response team, how do you handle staff turnover? That's a great, that's a really great question. Um, I, I don't know if we have, since we've been plugging away at this, you know, I don't, I don't know if we've really encountered too much of an issue with staff turnover and our efforts. I think, I think it's really a matter of just ongoing training, advocating for training um, wherever possible. Um, our disaster team, we've we've had them do some of the DIPSME webinars, and um, I think we even talked about um, the new upcoming AFR. Um, series of workshops as a potential for some, some of our other team members. But Tammy, do you have anything that you wanted to add to that? Sure. Um, we haven't had any turnover on the team yet. Um, we're actually approaching our second year of existence. But um, so far, when we return to work, I asked people if they were interested in continuing on the team and everyone volunteered to remain on, on the disaster preparedness team. So uh, we haven't had turnover yet on the team. We've had certainly turnover in the library. And one of the things that I would like to see us do is more training um, in a hands-on format, but that's not going to happen for at least another year. So, um, and that's due to the coronavirus not our situation here. But that's that's something we'd really like to do so that we have enough hands uh, if we ever have yet another big um, flood. The good news is we're thinking that um, in November, late November, we might be able to start moving the theses out of that room and at least prevent us from having to salvage yet another set of uh, student work. Um, I think that's all I can say about that. Okay. Um, the next question, whoops, it's, it's bouncing a little, so my, it's um, hard to keep track of. Uh, and I think it's, it's more 
concern during COVID-19. Um, what would you do if you had less staff available due to COVID-19? I am the only staff member remaining full time. Um, so in, I guess it sounds like in the event of an emergency, what do you do if you're the only one during a pandemic? Um, that's a really tough question to, to try and answer. And I think, I think the hard part when it comes to collections and taking care of collections is human safety comes first. Tammy, would you agree with that? Absolutely. Uh, one, one other uh, comment I would make is that um, part of the um, process of going through the uh, disaster preparedness planning um, part of that process is to try and find where are resources that you can reach out to. So one of the nice things about AFR is that it links people with first responders. So if you have a water disaster, ideally you would be um, aware of who to reach out to first. Uh, if you're a small historical society, you might know your, your, your fire um, and and folks immediately if you have a fire you might know them uh, you might try to get to know them on a first name basis in an organization like rpi where we're several uh layers removed from the people who call the fire department um you know it's a little harder but you know definitely reach out and try and find out are there volunteer organizations like afr for instance will connect you with a mentor and um i think that was important Unfortunately, Jen faced, you know, the perfect storm of everybody being out of town simultaneously. But ordinarily, that's not going to happen. But we're, we're fortunate that we don't often have terribly destructive hurricanes where everybody is dealing with the same problem at the same time. So there's usually going to be uh, volunteers available. Um, and that would be an important list to have on your prep, your pocket response plan. Um, just to know who you can reach out to in an emergency, because there probably are other people in the cultural resources field nearby who would be willing to lend a hand. Tammy, another question is, did, did you use a wet vac or dehumidifiers? So we don't have wet vacs per se, but in order to get the water out of the cage area, um, our environmental services staff use a water extractor. Um, it's an extremely powerful piece of machinery. And then we have an area where that water can be discarded. And so, but we don't have dehumidifiers though. Um, and Susan Dontremont mentioned CDLC's preservation interest group, which is, sounds fantastic. And they recently had a program on mold. We'll have to check that out. Way to go, Susan. Yeah. Um, but, uh, we've been thinking about getting a, an extractor for ourselves because this keeps happening. And if it happens in off hours when RPI is not op readily open, um, we come in and we're willing to do that extraction ourselves, but we don't have the equipment. We don't have access to it. Go ahead, Jen. You had another question to ask uh yeah just um, um someone else asking if we use dehumidifiers the answer is no and then um yes we used fans some pretty high powered uh floor fans we don't have uh i don't believe we have data loggers downstairs tammy that's correct right but we do have um we do have um a tool down there that checks the relative humidity we did have a data logger that uh, worked with like, I don't know, a DOS system or something a hundred years ago, but um, it has long since not been uh, something that you can, you know, plug in with a USB or anything like that. So unfortunately that is no longer something that we have in our arsenal. Um, and Tammy, this, this is definitely a question for you, I think, because you're so heavily involved in, you know, just like the, the building structure and everything, but had there been any discussion of proactively assessing the building's plumbing um, and the pipes overall, 
it seems leaks may well continue if the pipe sections are replaced only, quote, as needed as leaks become apparent. That is the question of the day, in my opinion. Um, I personally think that the entire design of the open plaza and storage area underneath it is just, it is just a bad plan. So beyond that, one, there are a couple of things that I would advocate for. One is to tear up the concrete and um, replace all of those, all of those pipes with PVC. That would make a huge difference because one of the things that happens is during the winter, um, you know, the environmental services people have to put down uh, salt and other, you know, stuff to get rid of the ice that builds up. They, they scrape off the snow, but then as people walk across the plaza, it tracks into ice. And so they put this stuff down and that then when things melt, it goes down into those metal pipes. So it's just causing them to rust out from the inside out. So yes, I would love to see a, a massive plan to get that done. I would also say that um, our supervisor uh, the Institute Archivist has been working for a couple of years to try and change the drainage pa patterns around the um, plaza storage area because the way it works, water actually goes uh, toward the building. And that's, that's just a, a bad, uh, again, a bad landscaping design. But there's not much you can do about it other than filling in tons of dirt. But we've got glass windows on the first floor. So just the way all of this all of this works it, it it really funnels water toward our storage areas so the more important issue in my opinion is to find better storage areas for our permanent records um, i don't care if you want to put extra um shelving units and stuff down there but it's not it's not safe it's not adequate for the collections that we have in the area and really right now, uh, given the funding that higher education, you know, the funding issues that higher education is dealing with, I don't see any of those big projects happening soon. This has been going on for years. So we keep trying to get this um, on a front burner, but we have not been successful and we have tried. Um, someone else, Tammy, is mentioning Tyvek to encapsulate damp materials and that they don't see this recommendation consistently. I don't think that I've come across that, have you? I'm not, I don't quite follow what that means. Um, you would never encapsulate something that's damp because you would hold in the dampness. The whole point is to get air circulation mm -hmm. around wet materials so that they dry um, because once they're dry, the, even if there are mold spores, it, it can't, create a bloom like what we experienced. So I'm not quite sure what the Tyvek, the purpose of the Tyvek would be. Yeah, we, we can always um, re reach out to um, Julia who's, who's, who has asked that question. Um, let's see. Yes, and maybe our Dipsney folks can help answer it too. Yes, in fact, Anastasia has just asked, um, I can follow up. Oh yes, Seth, and include. Oh nope, I read that wrong. Too fast. It's moving too fast. <laughs> okay. Um, where did that question just go? I apologize. <laughs> oh yes, Anastasia says she can follow up with CCH. Oh, excellent. Great. Okay. Oh yes. Did you freeze? Did you freeze any of the bound volumes? No, we did not. Um, we did not have access to a freezer of any kind. And while there are, um, you know, commercial companies that will, will do that, um, we had not um, contracted with any of them because we kept hoping just to get somebody in to do the cleanup. It took way longer than we expected, but, um, I think in the future, if we if we deal with something where it looks like we're not going to be able to handle the wet materials quickly enough to prevent a mold outbreak, that that's really something that we have to consider. But right now, what we're doing is anytime it rains, we're getting somebody down there and 
fortunately, now that we have um, most of the staff in the in the building on a regular basis, people are checking that that space because it doesn't have to rain for water to start um, coming out of a broken pipe because there's always standing water in those pipes. So yeah, we have to just keep an eye on things for now and um, you know do the best we can under the circumstances. I there there are some more comments, but um, I think for the most part, I believe that all of the questions have been answered. Oh, can you repeat the timeline from the first pipe break and then finding the mold? Okay. <laughs> That's going to be on you. <laughs> so the first pipe we found in 2018, August of 2018, and then and, and the volumes were removed from the top shelves. And it was it was two weeks later that I was asked to take a look at what had been removed. And that's when I noticed mold on the covers of the volumes. And then about three days later, three days-ish later, I discovered when I realized that, oh my goodness, I didn't, I did not investigate the entire area. I just had tunnel vision and focused on what was right in front of me. Um, that's when I noticed a little bit more, um, down in thesis storage and then oh goodness um i'm trying to retrace my own timeline tammy this is actually quite challenging wasn't it, wasn't it uh eight weeks between when the you first between when it the pipe broke and when yeah it was, it was totally out of control yeah so let's see two weeks and then probably by the so by the third week that's when my colleagues from the state archives came over and that's when we fold the found the nastiest parts and we were, we moved more theses out to compact shelving and then um by week eight what had remained on some of the other shelving units that we had checked and we thought they were in the clear that's when we found more mold so yeah, we're talking about a, an eight week period. I hope that was helpful. And then it was another year after the, that final step when we were able to get the uh, remediation team in. And boy, did they clean that room fast. It, it was pretty amazing. Um, really quite amazing how, how effective they were. Let's see. Managing mold guidelines mention the use of Tyvek briefly as a short term means. I wonder if what that means is to segregate the moldy stuff from the clean stuff, but I, I don't know. Hmm. But it looks like there's some links in there in the chat that people can follow. Yeah, and I'm not sure if we mentioned this, but uh, Tammy and I will be sent this chat read and if we've missed anything we are happy to follow up and okay i think something else came in but um it might be for someone else but nevertheless um i'm getting the sense that there may not be any more questions um, i just like to add a comment myself and one of them is that as a follow-up to our um you know the problems that we encountered in august when we weren't in the building we now know that we have to share our pocket response plans with the folks who are on the um, environmental services staff we thought about it in terms of our own staff but since we weren't in the building it, was, it is now important to be thinking okay what if what if what if and so um we've started putting those together for the environmental services staff make sure you communicate very very well 
Uh, is it, oh, there is one more question. In retrospect, what is your current advice in the presence of water? Um, when water, it sounds like they're asking just if water is present, I imagine. Yeah, just get rid of it as quickly as you can. And and I really do think that having a shop vac or, you know, the kind that, that is designed for water um, and some place to dump dump the water um, is really important. If you have dehumidifiers that can go, that can empty into a drain, great. In our experience, however, the drains were one of the backup um, <laughs> mode so that was a bit of a problem we we had to close them off um yeah just that's when you think about it um if if you were to see what the uh, recommendations are on afr's supplies list a lot of it is about dealing with water whether you have a fire or almost any other kind of emergency water tends to be the big issue so having lots of rags having lots of paper towels um, having caution tape so you can section off an area to protect people. Those are all really important things to have on hand because water is um, one of the major reasons that there are that there's damage to collections and we've certainly experienced it. Um, we've actually in some cases been very lucky that we've had minimal damage regardless of the amount of water that's come in but yeah you just have to get rid of it and try and get you know, if, if, you're ha if you have water coming into your building, if you can make sure that the uh, landscaping angles away from your basement, that's going to help. It probably won't uh, address all of your problems. Were there any additional questions? I am not seeing any additional questions, so... My sense is that maybe we are moving beyond mold. <laughs> yes, and I just would like to read one person's comment. Share your plan with the local fire department to water has been found when water has been found around materials. Oh no, that's, I'm sorry, it moved. <laughs> <laughs> but sharing, yes, sharing your plan is a great idea. Certainly, yes. Thank you for your comments. All right, I believe that, yeah, we've uh, probably exhausted the Q&A. Yes, indeed. And please so. don't have a building like ours. <laughs> so thank you so much, everyone. This has been a lot of fun sharing this story with you all. And we will certainly follow up. Yes, thanks a lot. And I just want to quickly say thank you to Jen and Tammy for sharing with us this crazy adventure that you've been on over the past many months. Um, also recognizing that when we first started talking about this program, part of the story hadn't even happened. The August issues hadn't even, I think, begun when we were lining up this program. So it's a growing story. Yes, Anastasia, I remember when you asked me, and it was two weeks later, I said, well, have I got a story for you? <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much for taking the time to share this story with us. And as we've said throughout the webinar, we'll be following up with a number of resources, as well as the slides and the recording by next week, about a week from today. Um, and I'm already working on answers for the Tyvek question as well. So we'll include those in the follow-up email. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Anastasia. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. So.